Harry Krishna, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition or episode of the Harry Krishna Project Podcast. This is episode number 88. We are uh, slowly moving to that very big number of 100. Um, but today we are broadcasting, bringing to you episode number 88. Thank you to everyone who continues to tune in on a regular basis, uh, now from all over the world, to hear or watch what our guests are up to. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, please do hit that all-important subscribe button so you keep updated about future podcasts and news updates from the Harry Krishna Project. And also, if you're watching this on Facebook, please do like or follow the Harry Krishna Project Facebook page so you're kept updated with also future podcasts and future news updates about what we're up to. Uh, as you know, we don't just produce podcasts, we do other exciting things as well. Um, this is very different for me because uh, I'm, I'm interviewing a guest uh, from a country that A, I've never been to, B, I don't think I've ever spoke to anyone who lives from that, who lives in that country. Absolutely delighted to welcome guest number 88, it's Amala Prema. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Narada. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to have you with us. Um, Amala, I'm going to ask you, Amala Prema, I'm going to ask you, uh, the, the first question is the question that every guest gets to start off the conversation. Please tell us a bit about you and where you're from. My name is, as you have already said, Amala Prema David Asi, and uh, I'm 47 years old, and I'm from Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina. I've lived here most of my life. And also I joined uh, the Hare Krishna movement and uh, started practicing the uh, Krishna consciousness uh, in, in Sarajevo in 1995. Wow, that's a long time ago. Yes, <laughs> all my adult life. Yeah, that was the year I started secondary school. <laughs> 1995. <laughs> um, so did you have any particular um, um, upbringing, uh, religious upbringing? Uh, well, my parents both were religious, but they divorced when I was very young. And uh, due to the divorce and change in life and uh, all of that, they didn't really have much time uh, to dedicate to my spiritual upbringing or religious upbringing. So I knew about God and all that, but uh, they never sent me to... Uh, religious school for children. Uh, by the way, both of my parents were Muslims. But my mother in spare time, she would uh, teach me some prayers and she would talk to me about God, but it was very, very rudimentary. And then uh, uh, when I was almost 16, the war broke out in former Yugoslavia, as we all know. And uh, my father decided uh, to send me to 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 Croatia to live there with a, a family that were his friends to save me from the atrocities of war and i'm eternally grateful uh, to him for that and then you know of course i was very much scared for my child uh, for my parents who were left behind and um, always fearing for their lives and my brother uh, i have uh, an older brother he was 18 at that time, he was sent to live in Germany. So, it, you know, the whole family was scattered. Everything was very uncertain. Death was all around. And I was in a, a new environment. I mean, I knew Croatia from before. It was in the town of Split. But it was, you know, completely different when you go there as a tourist, you know, uh, to the seaside in summertime. And everything was all right. Uh, it was completely different, um, you know, to start living there as a refugee. So all of these reasons, they are, they are big reasons, started, you know, made me question things, you know, made me ask important questions about life. You know, why do we die? Where do we come from? And why is this happening to me my and my family? And uh, are my parents going to stay alive? And then I remembered those prayers that my mother taught me and I started praying to God to, to save my parents. And I even prayed, you know, please take my life instead of theirs, just save them. And in my prayers, I always imagined God because I was uh, addressing him. I was turning directly mm -hmm. to him. And then uh, after two years, I could no longer stay with that family. And I was given a choice. So I could either go to 
Germany and live with my brother or return to Sarajevo and war was still on. And I decided to return to Sarajevo to be with my parents because I, I really could not bear no longer to, to live without them. And I wanted to help them somehow. I wanted to give my contribution to, to, to their struggle, you know, to help them survive. And I returned to Sarajevo and then um, I uh, started volunteering at a radio station because uh, I was always good at English in school. I went to grammar school and uh, I started working uh, as a volunteer uh, translator interpreter for English language. And one of the girls working there at the radio station, she was a sound technician. We, we used to talk about these topics because you become really philosophical and mm. existential when the war is around you mm. and death is around you. And it's an everyday fact and possibility. And we were talking about all these things. And she said, well, would you like to uh, go to the Center for Vedic Studies with me, you know, to, to hear a, a, a lecture about these topics? And I said, sure, why not? And then I went and it was an ISKCON temple and uh, there was a lecture uh, from uh, Bhagavad Gita as it is. Uh, and uh, the topic uh, was about what I was thinking about. And uh, it was also explained that uh, God had an image, but you know, Islam forbids depicting of God's image and everything. And it was explained that uh, that, that uh, in the Vedas, that of course, God has both the impersonal and personal aspect of its ex of his existence. And that sounded completely acceptable and logical to me. And then the devotees uh, explained uh, everything ab uh, about the law of karma and reincarnation. And this did not go on just in that first lecture. This went on for several days and weeks because I was completely drawn by that philosophy. And uh, once I started going to the temple, I, I never stopped. I was really, really fascinated by the philosophy. And it provided all the answers to all my questions that I didn't have before. And uh, I I was very much attracted to it. And, and then I started practicing Krishna consciousness and, and slowly uh, got rid of all my bad habits like you know, smoking. I used to smoke as all teenagers start in school. <laughs> and uh, I became vegetarian and I started chanting immediately and I read more Srila Prabhupada's books. Everything seemed perfectly logical and there was nothing that Srila Prabhupada couldn't explain. He explained mm -hmm. everything to me. And I accepted uh, in that way practicing Krishna consciousness, and uh, I I stayed <laughs> in Krishna tell, consciousness ever since. I've tell, been, us, uh, tell us a bit about that transition from mm -hmm. having a Muslim upbringing to mm -hmm. to Vaishnavism, because they're actually mm -hmm. very different. Islam and Vaishnavism, there are some similarities. There's similarities in every yes. religious tradition, but from Islam to Gaudiya Vaishnavism, what was that transition like? Was it easy or actually quite difficult? It was very easy for me because I said, as I said, uh, I was never uh, sent by my parents to Mektab, which in Arabic means, you know, a uh, religious school for children, like Sunday mm. school in Christianity. So I didn't have that uh, formal religious education. I went to uh, elementary school, which is, uh, of course, a secular school. And... Uh, or everything that I heard uh, about God, I heard from my mother. And that was not a lot, but I knew that uh, she always described God as a very compassionate, most compassionate supreme being, and that he loved us all and everything. So um, that's why I didn't have a really uh, big insight into Islam. I had more like a cultural approach because mm. all my family on both sides, mothers and fathers, were Muslim and I knew the cultural aspects of Islam, like Muslims are very hospitable people and uh, they try to treat everyone uh, nicely. And I knew that. And of course, when there was a religious holiday, we would celebrate. But uh, at that part uh, of his life, uh, my father was turned more to business. So he dedicated all his life to uh, business at that time. And he didn't uh, dedicate uh, time to my religious upbringing. He wanted me to do excel at school. He expected that of me. 
and I did that uh, and uh, mother as well. So there was no emphasis on religious upbringing. And that's why when I was introduced to Krishna consciousness, that was really my first big formal introduction and detailed introduction into the philosophy, the t spiritual teachings of a uh, religion. And uh, I was really uh, very, very overwhelmed by it and uh, positively. Especially because before I got interested into Krishna consciousness, uh, when I was living as a refugee in Split, I was surrounded by uh, Roman Catholics. It's, the population in Split is 100% uh, Roman Catholic. And uh, I heard about Jesus and uh, I, I you know, watched Jesus from Nazar Nazareth and I was introduced a little bit to, to, to Christian uh, teachings. And I liked that very much, but still there was no answer about, about this question, for this question, why is this happening to me? Why is war happening? Why are we suffering? There was never an answer to that. In Islam, my relatives would say only God knows why, is the, why this is happening, and we just have to accept it. Uh, it's our fate. And also Christianity didn't uh, offer an answer to that and i'm a, a kind of a person that when i have something stuck in my mind i will not let it go easily i keep searching until i find an answer so when i found an answer in uh, shla Prabhupada's books i was not letting go at all i was really uh, reading voraciously and going to the classes uh, every single day because uh, it was just completely how, how would I describe it? I was mesmerized by it mm -hmm. and I was overjoyed, you know, because when uh, uh, death is all around you and uh, you think you are this body and you are going, you can disappear any time uh, at any given day, you, you get panicked. I felt huge relief when I heard from Shiva Prabhupada, you know, that we are not this body, we are spirit soul, we are eternal, death is not the end, we just move on to, we are just, you know, casting uh, the old body as old clothes. And that completely removed that panic, that anxiety that I felt at that time, I was only 19. And this really, these questions haunted me, I, I had to have an answer because it was impossible to continue living with these, you know, absurd things uh, happening around me without an answer. I really, I, I loved your answer then, by the way. I, I, I asked a question, I was expecting quite a short answer, and you went into a lot of detail, which I really appreciated. I was thinking, I was thinking, because sometimes you ask people a question, and you're not sure what the response is going to be. I, when I, when I, um, got involved first got involved with the Krishna consciousness movement about 20 years ago one of the things if I'm honest because I had kind of a Christian upbringing mm -hmm. and one of the things that I struggled with for a while was accepting that or coming around to this idea that God is a or we're, we're shown that God is a, is a teenage boy a blue teenage boy with a flute because in 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 my, in the tradition I'm from, I always had these pictures of God in my head as a white man on a cloud, and he was very powerful and very um very majestic and very forgiving, but very powerful and very manly and very masculine, mm -hmm. and um and then I I struggled I struggled for many months to accept that actually God is uh, Krishna has taken the role of God or Krishna is 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 performing the role of God or God is Krishna and, and Krishna actually has a girlfriend and Krishna plays in the fields and Krishna plays music. And I really struggled with that, that, that God is also part feminine. So mm -hmm. that, that transition was quite difficult for me. The philosophy that we're not the body like you was very liberating. And I loved that mm -hmm. when I learned about that because it gave me so many answers and also my Christian upbringing, you know, we were kind of told, well, we just don't know. God knows everything. Don't worry about stuff too much, you know? Yes. Um, yes. That's typical. Um, we, <laughs> I we, think uh, everywhere. Only God, only God knows. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. You know, so it, one of one of the things I loved about Vaishnavism, Vedic mm -hmm. philosophy, Vedic texts was that those answers were there. Mm -hmm. Well, those answers are there in the Bhagavad Gita. Yes. Bhagavad Gita. Yes, um, absolutely. So it was quite a nice kind of liberating feeling. Um, so tell us a bit about 
I'm I'm keen to know because I, I I have to be honest. I know nothing about I know I know very little about Bosnia and Herzegovina, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I therefore but uh, know very little about the Hare Krishna movement in Bosnia Herzegovina. Mm-hmm. So tell us a bit about um I guess uh your early years in the movement mm-hmm. in the mid nineties and in terms of what's it like today the Hare Krishna movement um mm-hmm. you know I guess that's kind of tell us about twenty seven years in in 15 minutes, if, if possible. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, the Krishna consciousness was introduced to uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, which was a republic in the former Yugoslavia in the beginning of the 80s of the last century. So the first devotees came from Croatia and they established a small center and they started uh, preaching and they started uh, attracting a lot of young people because uh, before the war, uh, people were very much interested in uh, different uh, types of knowledge and uh, esoteric knowledge and they were seeking answers and uh, they loved to read a lot, Mm. especially younger generations, you know, before the internet and everything. That's how you found out about something new, you read books. And uh, when uh, devotees from Croatia came and brought uh, Srila Prabhupada's books, which was uh, which were translated into Serbo-Croatian, uh, and that language was spoken uh, here, and it was also the official language, it was uh, a big gift that uh, the citizens of Sarajevo and Bosnia-Herzegovina got. And there was a huge interest, and uh, some of them joined the temple, but then the war broke out in 1992, and uh, many devotees left, you know, to save their lives. And uh, those few young devotees who had uh, just joined stayed and tried to, you know, continue with the mission. And they did really a heroic, uh, heroic uh, deed because even when the city was under siege and pounded daily, uh, the, the temple president, Mataji, she would go out and uh, when there was no shelling in those breaks between the shellings, she would go to these international humanitarian organizations who, which um, uh, used to distribute uh, humanitarian aid to the citizens of Sarajevo and she would get um, that humanitarian aid, she would bring it back to the temple and then devotees would prepare some kind of uh, uh, prasadam and, uh, and then they would get uh, on their bikes, take that prasadam with them and uh, they would distribute prasadam in the hospital where and, and there were patients and she, they would give uh, prasadam to those patients and all of that was uh, under very, very difficult and dangerous conditions because, you know, Nothing was working. The city was under siege. There was no public transportation. There was constant danger, but they still pushed on with the Shla Prabhupada's mission and they distributed the uh, cookies or other types of prasadam food, you know, uh, in the hospital, uh, even to the doctors and nurses. And this was much appreciated because um, food was very, very scarce. And uh, they also continued uh, distributing books as well and uh, then when the war ended uh, some devotees left some new ones uh, joined and it was a struggle because you know devotees were also trying to rebuild their lives and they uh, continued with their service but you know always devotees were coming and going and as the year progressed uh, the temple was also moving it was never an iskon property it was always a rented house and it is to this day but devotees uh, uh, continued with the mission, distributing books and uh, distributing prasadam and also chaining up new devotees and uh, even organizing cultural festivals, you know, for the larger audiences of Sarajevo and going in uh, outside of the city into other towns and uh, bringing Krishna consciousness there. So it was never easy. It was always a struggle, uh, but they continued. Uh, however, in a post-war country, there are larger other issues such as, you know, a lack of uh, jobs and uh, high unemployment rate, uh, uh, high corruption rate. So devotees, in order to, you know, um, sort out their lives, uh, often leave country. They leave and uh, they try uh, living elsewhere. 
because finish, they finish their education here and they try to make a living uh, somewhere else in Europe or North America or Australia. So that's why it has always been a struggle to maintain the temple. And nowadays it, it's more like a small center. There are no full-time devotees. Uh, it's maintained by the congregational members and uh, they're trying to do whatever they can. But uh, the, the number of devotees has really dwindled. And that's why it has always been a challenge. But yeah, of course, they are doing whatever they can. So that's in a nutshell, if I can, you know, say what's been going on, that has been going on. And um, yeah, I would say that it was uh, very difficult, but devotees were doing the best that they could. And are there any devotees still involved now that were involved during the war in the early 90s? Yes, the, the, that uh, that Mataji, that devotee who was the temple president during the war, she's still here, but she wow. doesn't live in the temple. She lives in her apartment, but she's still here. And uh, yeah, uh, there, she, she's she been here all, not all the time. She also went to France for some time, but came back. And the others, uh, well, I'm afraid that most of them have scattered around the world. Mm. Wow. I feel like they're heroes in the sense that, you know, particularly this lady, yeah. you know, after 30 years, she's still around. And, you know, just what you said that during the war 30 years ago, she was helping to distribute humanitarian aid and prasadam to, to like hospitals and things. I think that's quite amazing because absolutely, it, it can be quite easy just to kind of give up sometimes. And, you know, mm -hmm. when you're faced with something like war, I've never experienced war, you know, mm -hmm. certainly Britain's. Britain's never been at war in that sense for 75 years. Yeah. I mean, we've been involved in wars, but they've not been on British soil. You know, the British yes. soldiers or army have been sent elsewhere, you know, uh, to like Iraq and stuff, but I've never experienced mm -hmm. war. So I've, I feel quite overwhelmed when I hear stories of what you've just said, that, you know, that she was out, you know, in between the shelling. Wow. Yes, yes, not just her, but other devotees as well. They would just take up their bikes, get on their bikes and, you know, uh, bring boxes or backpacks of prasadam with them and that's how they would go to the hospital downtown mm. and, and then they would uh, distribute uh, the cakes and the cookies uh, to the patients nurses and doctors and uh, one of the doctors was a famous surgeon he uh, got the Bhagavad Gita as it is and he used to read it during his surgeries and he was a big big friend of devotees he was very fond of us so uh, the devotees really had a very good reputation during the war as those helping uh, the citizens of Sarajevo to survive. Mm. So it was really heroic. And I think, uh, not it's not that I think, I know that Indra Dumna Maharaj described it also partly in his uh, book, Diary of a Traveling Monk. If you look up uh, uh, that diary and uh, under chapter from Yugoslavia, Bosnia, you will find uh, his account of uh, his visit to to uh, to Sarajevo, and uh, he also writes about this strategy and the other devotees. So it is quite heroic, really. It was uh, very very difficult, but that just illustrates the power of faith. When when you have faith in Krishna, and when you want to serve him and serve his devotees, Shla Prabhupada and to give Krishna consciousness to others, nobody and nothing can stop you, even in the most difficult conditions. And, uh, and their story is a testimony to that. Mm. So there's an ISKCON center now, uh, yes. which is open. I mean, how, how many, is it like open on a Sunday or during the week? Uh, yes, it's mostly open on a Sunday. On the workday, it's not so much. Uh, also, it's open for the major Vaishnava festivals, mm -hmm. but because of the lack of full-time devotees, it's, uh, it's not open full-time. Mm. And do you have uh, visiting sannyasis? I mean, do 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 sannyasis from Iskon visit regularly or every now and then? It's mostly every now and then, and uh, the one that visits the most is uh, Ananda Tirta Swami. He's the first Croatian sannyasi, so he's also physically close to us, so it's mm. uh, more convenient to him to visit. But yeah, uh, since the war ended, uh, many sannyasis and other preachers visited the uh, Sarajevo temple, such Maharaj, Krishna Kshetra Maharaj, Bir Krishna Maharaj, uh, 
Jap Taka Maharaj, then uh, Rahini Sutta Prabhu, uh, Chandra Mali Maharaj, Pralvananda Maharaj, uh, Smita Krishna Maharaj. Yeah, a lot of them, a lot mm. of them, but not on, on a regular basis. Mm. And how is the Krishna consciousness movement um, received in Bosnia and Herzegovina in terms of, you know, do, do, do the public think that you're just all a bit weird? Or are you welcomed as part of society? What's the kind of what? How how did the public perceive you? Mm -hmm. Well, I tried personally with my service to to help that public perception uh, to make it a positive one of the devotees. Because as I have told you before, uh, by my education, I'm a journalist, although currently not working as one at the moment, uh, and uh, when I joined the movement, I heard Shla Prabhupada saying that anything could be used in service of Krishna mm. and that it's completely voluntary and that you decide how you want to serve and uh, I was thinking okay what I know what do I know what can I do to contribute to Shla Prabhupada's mission and then uh, uh, I thought okay I will use my journalistic knowledge to do or to preach or to present uh, Krishna consciousness and ISKCON to the public and this devotee who actually brought me to the temple the first time she was my colleague at the radio station she also had an idea and uh, she uh, created uh, uh, this radio uh, program called the higher taste and she offered me uh, the role of the speaker so that i would uh, present krishna consciousness and she would be you know in the booth as the sound technician and uh, and i accepted and that's how we started and uh, that was just my first step in that public presentation i continued throughout the years to to present krishna consciousness in various tv programs and also collaborated with other journalists from tv stations some of them local some of them uh, on the national level and um, i also wrote for the social media and uh, thanks to that and not only to that, also thanks to the distribution of books uh, by devotees and distribution of prasadam, the public uh, gained more insight into uh, ISKCON and the lives of devotees and our philosophy, and they could really understand why and what we were doing and why we were doing it. And that helped. And uh, generally, the, the perception is very good because uh, Sarajevo has always been a cosmopolitan city. Mm. Will find uh, you will find all four uh, religious uh, major religions uh, here in in Sarajevo. So there is uh, Orthodox Christianity. Uh, there is also Roman Catholicism, Islam, and Judaism. So it's always been a cultural melting pot. And uh, somebody presenting Krishna consciousness uh, was not uh, something. Uh, that they would have initial aversion to it because they are used they, they are already used to this combination of uh, religions and um, mostly we are positively uh, received when you go outside of sarajevo into small smaller uh, areas rural areas that's more of a challenge mm -hmm. and there is opposition there because people do not uh, do not like to open themselves to something new and uh, they're a bit skeptical and let us also no, not forget the big big thing after the war that the whole country has and that is the PTSD you know there's a lot of trauma especially because religion was uh, dragged into the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, that's why people somehow sometimes can be really stubborn and uh, defensive about their religion and uh, closed for any presentation of anything else, anything different from their belief. So, uh, so that's it. And but I would say overall, generally, it's uh, positive. Although it could be better, it could be better. There are there are some challenges. And uh, this definitely requires more attention. But for the time being, that is the situation. You mentioned that you were presenting something called the Higher Taste Radio Show. Mm -hmm. um, do you still do that now? No, we stopped a long time ago because as soon as our editor-in-chief <laughs> found out that we were really open and he said, you know, this is girls this is a, like a big presentation if you want to do that and, and then you have to pay for it and for some time 
I was uh, looking for donors and uh, I found even some of uh, the donors. One of them was my father <laughs> so that we could continue with the show, but we could not continue forever. So we stopped. But that that was just, you know, the idea that got the, the, the whole thing rolling and uh, the, it definitely directed me in that uh, direction. Mm -hmm. And I continued presenting Krishna consciousness on TV. Uh, as I said, I also contacted a lot of uh, journalists and uh, uh, offered them the idea uh, of presenting uh, Krishna consciousness and uh, the lives of devotees and ISKCON. And they accepted that. So they made some uh, interesting, very well presented shows. Wow. So, yeah, yeah, I have it in my archive. Uh, yeah. The, several several tv stations did that so that was good and um, it, it didn't stop there it, we, in the higher taste program was just a start actually and uh, but once you once you start doing it you get really you really get the taste for it so you can't stop and you know as Srila Prabhupada says preaching is the life so mm -hmm. once you taste that you, you never can stop really you're just always looking for opportunities where you can do that so so I definitely continued and the social media was just a natural extension of that you know as the social media were developing and we saw we all saw the opportunity there and we continued that so there is the page also now uh, that I edited for many years and wrote at that page. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I did quite a lot there, but it's actually all mercy of Srila Prabhupada, his disciples, because everything I know, I, I learned from them. Mm. Definitely. And my own spiritual master also told me that uh, I should use this journalistic knowledge in uh, spreading Krishna consciousness. So it's actually... Their mercy. I just used the tool that I uh, had, you know, with my higher education. Mm -hmm. I find that very encouraging. It's very encouraging to hear a devotee talk about using the media to spread Krishna consciousness. I also work in the media kind of PR and marketing. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I had that kind of same realization about 10 years ago. Well, I'm quite good at writing stories for newspapers and I, I write stories for newspapers and I, I produce content for radio, TV. So why don't I do it for Krishna? You know, absolutely. Yes. It's not about giving it up, is it? It's not about no. giving up these things and moving into no. a temple and being, uh, bored for the rest of my life no offense to people who live in temples but uh, i just it's just not for me you know i want to be out in the world doing things exactly exactly and that's what that is actually what shula Prabhupada wanted us to do because i've been you know studying his life all my adult life mm -hmm. and that's what he wanted us to do that we use whatever skills and knowledge we have to present krishna consciousness uh, because that is the mission to give it to the others, not to stay in the temple, eat kitri, and uh, not <laughs> preach. Because that's not our mission, you know. When when uh, you know, I don't know if you heard of that uh, case when uh, Shila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur uh, once went into the Brahmachari ashram, and when he saw all the Brahmacharis, you know. Uh, completely unenthusiastic because it was a Kadashi and they were all fasting and not doing anything and said what are you doing you know and he told the temple cook cook kitri for them and then you should all take kitri and go outside and uh, uh, preach because and they said but Guru Maharaj it's Kadashi and said I don't care our our mission is not to sit in the temple and eat it's to give Krishna consciousness to the others. So I found that, you know, case, that uh, example very fascinating and really to the point of, of our mission, you know, just give it to others. So you you use whatever knowledge you, you have to do that. And I was pretty fanatical at the beginning as well. I was 19, I joined uh, the movement and I wanted to do, to, come and live to the temple and I didn't want to pursue my university education and my mother became completely justifiably up, very much upset and she said why are you giving up your university education I said no I just want to surrender my life to Krishna and go and live in the temple 
And then she asked uh, for a meeting with uh, a visiting preacher at the time, and she explained the situation. And he asked me, well, what do you want? What did you originally want to study? And I said, journalism. And he said, great, why don't you study journalism and then use it for Christian consciousness? And that's how <laughs> they also got me off the idea to come and to live in the, in the temple. And later on, I really realized that it was much better. It was much better for me personally, and it was much better uh, for for the service, you know, because I was really able to render some service and uh, make use of those skills. And uh, it pacified my mother. And uh, she also started coming to the classes and because she saw a great interest in me and that I gave up all my old friends and stopped going out. And she was very surprised by all of this uh, transformation. And then I told her, you know, I invited her to come to the temple to to hear uh, a lecture for herself because she always loved to read. She read a lot. And then she came and she you know, liked it and she continued coming. And then she joined also Krishna consciousness and she accepted it. Although she was a, a devout Muslim, she understood the, 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 the value of this uh, spiritual knowledge that is just more information about God and everything than she uh, knew before. And she also became initiated devotee. So wow. from that, uh, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. And she even went to... For 17 years, she went um, for six months to live in Vrindavan and do seva there. Wow. So, yeah, yeah, in Krishna Balara Mandir. So, and then after the two of us, my brother joined as well. I find that amazing. <laughs> are your are your parents still with us now? No, my mother left her body uh, three years ago at the beginning of the pandemic. It was not due to the corona. She uh, she had a heart disease, so she left her body, and uh, before that, she was in Vrindavan for 17 years, um, you know, half of the year, or last 17 years of her life, she would spend in Vrindavan serving there, wow. until she became seriously ill and could no longer render that service, and she came back to Sarajevo, and I took care of her, and then... Very soon she she left her body because uh, it was a very serious disease. But yeah, she also accepted uh, Krishna consciousness, and it was wonderful to to have not just a mother but also a, a devotee, a very serious, uh, committed, dedicated devotee in my mother. And so I could also talk about spiritual life with her. You know, have that exchange. It was really it really enriched our relationship uh, very much. So and, yes. And your brother, he's still around practicing yes. Krishna consciousness? Uh my brother is also an initiated devotee and uh, uh he married a devotee as well and there is a funny story about uh, all our names because uh, we all chose the same spiritual master and then and I was the first one to get initiated and then my brother and the last one was my mother. And then when she came before the spiritual master, the temple president said, she's the mother of your two disciples, Amala Prema and Damodar Prema. And uh, Guru Maharaj was very surprised. said, really? You're the, their mother? And she said, yes. And then he already uh, had prepared a name for her. But when he heard this piece of information, he wanted to change her name. And he asked his servants to give him the laptop with the database of all his disciples' names. And he was looking, checking, you know, for names that were free that he could still give to new disciples. And then he found the name and uh, he gave her the name Eka Prema Devidasi. So he said, we have to keep Prema in the family. Wow. <laughs> so we all have Prema in our names. And my uh, elder son, when he heard this story, he said, mom, when I grow up and if I become initiated, will I be a prema as well? <laughs> That's quite amazing. I love that. Kind of keep, keeping it in the family. Yeah. yeah is yes, the expression. Yes. Um, yes, yes. Um, I, I love that story, actually. I mean, my, my family have never taken an interest in Krishna consciousness. I think largely because I've never wanted to push anything on them. I mean, they, they, mm -hmm. they can ask questions if they want to, uh, you know, they know I'm, 
that I don't eat meat. Uh, they mm -hmm. know, you know, this is the lifestyle that I live. And they're very supportive of that. I mean, my mum, about 10 years ago, my mum came to a Kirtan event, uh, but mm -hmm. only because only because the Kirtan was happening at Stonehenge uh, for, the uh -huh. for the summer solstice. And she always wanted to uh, to go to Stonehenge. So she was more interested in Stonehenge really than the devotees. But mm -hmm. um, the devotees were there and there was a big Kirtan. And I said to my mum, oh, I'm just going to go and sit in the Kirtan and do some chanting. And mm -hmm. I could see she was over the edge, like watching him. And she kept looking at her watch like this. And, you know, when you're in a Kirtan, you just go a lot. You're just going to go. You just don't know. And, and before I knew it, a whole hour had passed by. Mm -hmm. and then I realized I was meant to be at Stonehenge with my mom. I wasn't really mm -hmm. meant to be hanging out with my friends. So I I, I went with my mom mm -hmm. and I didn't realize a whole hour had passed by. And she said, the first thing she said was, don't they sing any other songs? They only know one song. <laughs> and it was quite like funny. And I just think my mom, you know, I don't, I mean, what what does devotee mean? But I don't think she's going to convert to Gaudiya Vaishnavism in this life, but mm -hmm. that's fine. I mean, she's very nice and she's very friendly, but um, yeah, she's just living a different type of life. My family are not really kind of that interested. <laughs> um, so, but I love your story. And can I ask which spiritual master you all took shelter of? Uh, His Holiness Jabtak Maharaj. Wow, Jai Pataka Swami. He, he has mm -hmm. a lot of disciples here in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, one of my good friends is a disciple of his. Mm -hmm. um, so does Jai Pataka Swami visit Bosnia-Herzegovina? He visited uh, uh, in 2005, and then after the stroke, uh, he didn't visit uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, but he did visit Croatia, which is our neighboring country. Yeah. And um, they're our neighbors, so it's easy for us to uh, go there. So when he, whenever he goes to uh, Croatia or Slovenia, which is also fairly close, we go there. Last time he was in uh, Slovenia, it was 2016, seven years ago. But it's been, you know, more difficult because of uh, his health. Yeah. His body is not in such great uh, shape. And um, because of that, it's a challenge for him to travel. But he still pushes on, you know, he has that unbelievable, unyielding determination to serve Srila Prabhupada. So even with such medical issues and challenges he continues traveling and uh, i know that he, recently he was uh, in the uk as well so he does travel but not as much as in the past mm. has he yet surpassed the fifty thousand disciple mark has he i don't know anything officially but unofficially i would say yes Yes, I, I don't know if he is keeping a list or his his secretary or something. Um, yes, I, I, they have they have records. They have all records. the disciples. Yes, no, the names I, and everything. I actually met Jai Patakaswami in New Delhi in um, mm -hmm. 2013, I think, and I was just on my own traveling around India, visiting mm -hmm. visiting Hare Krishna temples, and I was at the New Delhi temple, just kind of going around taking photos and. Um, um what happened um i was kind of he he I, it was just a quiet day there was someone doing kirtan and i was taking pictures of all the deities and stuff and then mm -hmm. he he there was this kind of commotion going on at the side of the temple like something was happening and i kind of looked over and and then the crowd um a crowd came in and the crowd moved and it was jai pataka swami mm -hmm. oh wow or jai pataka swami's arrived so i kind of just slowly walked up you know like this is the this is the journalist in me kept like just taking photos right and then he looked at me and he said um have we met before oh uh, have we met before you, you you're from america you, you're a journalist from america right i said i i don't think so i don't think we've ever met in this life it was like mm -hmm. i said it in a funny way and he laughed and then he took with his one hand he took off his garland and he put it over mm -hmm. my he took put it over my neck mm -hmm. And I then took that garland back to the UK and I, I must have kept it for years before I before I moved house. But I really kept that garland because you know, oh, that's like, wonderful. Yeah, that's it was really quite wonderful. Um, and then I and then I saw him. I didn't see him on his recent trip. But mm -hmm. when he was in the UK before the pandemic, I went to one of his initiation ceremonies where quite a few of my friends were being initiated. And mm -hmm. it was um, quite a big event, you know, so lots of uh, devotees wearing their... Uh, 
their their kurtas and their dhotis and there was me turning up as a kind of a krishna west devotee wearing my jacket you know <laughs> to, i was the only one the only one wearing a jacket and trousers because that's that's the kind of good, good for you good yeah for you. that's kind of like the mood that i try and follow um uh-huh. that's wonderful and you know um i always say this to every guest but i about where they're from i would love to visit bosnia herzegovina one day uh-huh. You know, I mean, I remember this war that you've talked about. And I was mm-hmm. I was well, I was uh, I was 10 years old in 1994. Um, mm. I'm going to be 40 next year. <laughs> and so I remember the war on the war on the TV, watching it on the mm-hmm. TV. But I was I was young at the time. And I remember mm-hmm. seeing the images of just the horrors of the things that were happening. Mm. And, you know, so I'm really delighted to hear that you know, 30 years later, Krishna consciousness is still being practiced. Um, yes, definitely. It's quite definitely. a, it's quite a heartwarming story, actually, I think. Because, because Maya is strong and it is so easy to give up. It is, but you know, the war and the war is a very traumatic experience. Although I was not here when the worst fighting was going on, it's still a big trauma that you don't know what is going to happen the next day if you are going to have parents or not. And uh, it really forces you to question death and life and God and the purpose of our existence. It was no other way for me because it's such a huge, huge, huge impact on my life and the lives of everyone that I know in this country. So actually it's the only thing that gives you solace and my mother told me because she was here in the besieged city the whole time and we talked about it afterwards you know about her experiences and said and she told me that had it not been quote had it not been for god and my faith in god i would have uh, i would have gone insane and of quote that's what she told me what kept her sane through all the uh, you know shelling and uh, atrocities that she experienced that she saw um, she was not wounded uh, she was not captured but still you know living uh, in a scarcity of food uh, with no electricity no running water only periodically receiving those uh, things and uh, seeing death all around you trying to 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 give some kind of a contribution to the defense of the city that's like a huge trauma there's nothing mm. bigger and i remember also my father telling me that once in his um, in his block where we lived in that residential area shelling started Sh- shelling had started and people started uh, running for cover and uh, he didn't and people were shocked that he was not running and later on he told them uh, well, you know, I came to the point where I really didn't care anymore. And I thought, well, I've lived my life. If I'm going to die, I'm going to die. But I'm just going to stop running. I'm so sick and tired of it. So it's a special trauma, you know, for the people who are under siege, being compl- constantly shelled, trying to fight back. But after a longer period of time, uh, they lost uh, the strength. And, you know, they, they completely lost the strength to keep on fighting because those conditions are unbearable so yeah you know to to have faith in god uh, in those moments is most precious actually Mm. and it uh, it is what saved my mother and also my father although he didn't speak about it so much but my mother did you know it's different you know between daughters and mothers they are closer so my mother confided this in in me and uh, it really illustrated the importance of a relationship with God in one's life. And then when she uh, read Shla Prabhupada's books, when she heard the classes and she asked questions, she, she accepted uh, Krishna consciousness because she was always sincere, even in Islam. She was a, a sincere practitioner. So to her, uh, to transit into Krishna consciousness was also natural, maybe not so fast as for me, but uh, definitely natural. And then when she applied herself uh, to it, she was such a serious committed devotee. And uh, I was amazed at the austerities that she tolerated in Vrindavan. You know, I would ask her, mom, how can you tolerate, uh, you know, the cold in, in Vrindavan? It's very cold in the winter because they do not have central heating as we do in Europe. 
And she said, well, you know, living in a holy place means you you accept austerities. And she never complained. She she would just, you know, bundle up and uh, carry on and you know, carry on with her uh, service. And she would always go to Mangalarati and she always chant. So it would be, you, you would really see that Krishna consciousness for her, it was com completely her life especially mm -hmm. that later part of, of her life, you know, when my brother and I grew up and had our own families, uh, so she could completely dedicate herself to, to Krishna consciousness and to service, and she went to live in Vrindavan. So it was her whole life, and she was the happiest there. So it really uh, demonstrates the importance of relationship uh, with God in one's life. Mm -hmm. That's quite... Um quite touching to hear about actually and uh to certainly to be reminded of your mother's story living in Vrindavan um yeah all that time um okay um I had so many things rushing through my head and so many questions and you started talking about your mum again and I got just got really literally my mind got so transfixed on Vrindavan and I forgot <laughs> what questions I was going to ask um can we talk a bit about uh, your kind of professional life? Uh, mm -hmm. That's if Krishna consciousness is unprofessional, but your professional life uh, in terms of being a journalist and an English, uh, you're an English interpreter. Yes, um, yes, yes. So tell us a bit about your work in terms of what do you do and why are you so enthusiastic about it? Mm. Well, I started as a journalist, but as I said, it was a post-war period, so it was not paid and I needed really to get paid, quite as simple as that. And since I was also working as a translator, interpreter at the radio station as well, I started freelancing as an interpreter for many foreign journalists uh, that worked in uh, my city who came during the war in the city and uh, some of them continued reporting even after the war ended. So I remember one of my first assignments uh, was working with the BBC World Service and wow. uh, in, in particular I worked with Alan Little he uh, was the foreign correspondent. He wrote, together with Laura Silver, he wrote the book, The Death of Yugoslavia. And after the book was published, it was uh, made into a docu-series by the BBC. It's a very good one. So I worked as an interpreter uh, for him and other BBC journalists, um, like Jeremy Bowen as well, and Kate A.D., and after that was finished, because I would finish working as soon as they would finish their assignment and go back to the UK. So I continued freelancing and then I uh, started working uh, full time uh, for the implementation forces. Those were the NATO led military forces that were in charge of implementation of the Dayton Peace Agreement that was made during the war and that peace agreement is basically what ended the war. Wow. So I started working full time uh, with them and uh, I worked uh, as media analyst and also as an interpreter for 16 years until they downsized. And that was a good job. That was an interesting job. It really opened up a lot of opportunities professionally for me. And I met a lot of interesting people, had a lot of interesting professional experiences. And it's important to me because I love English language, first of all. It's my first intellectual love. When I heard English when I was 10, I liked it immediately. And then when uh, I started English classes, I saw that I was good at it. And I saw that it was easy to me to pick it up. It was not difficult to me, really. And I was really always good at it. And... Uh, it just, to me, it was more than a language. It was, an uh, for me, it was a window into a different world because you know that former Yugoslavia had a communist regime and it was uh, different from Western Europe. We were behind these uh, so-called Iron Curtain, although communism here was much more liberal than in uh, uh, former USSR. But um, still, I didn't know much about Western Europe. I knew, you know, the basic things uh, from the books. But uh, to me, English was an opportunity to, to meet people from Western Europe and the rest of the world and to learn about them. I was always intrigued and interested to find about uh, how they live, you know, what are they like? What do they believe in? What's their lifestyle? What are... Uh, 
their cultures. I was always drawn to them. It's just part of my personality. So that's why I love English language because it enabled me to fulfill my wish. You know, I met a lot of people in my work. These NATO-led military forces meant uh, 28 nations from around the globe. Wow. And these were really interesting people, educated, experienced, and you could learn a lot professionally. And then you could, you know, familiarize yourself with uh, their cultures and personalities so and make friends. And you know, I'm ever grateful uh, for that as well. And um, not only that, my personality is that I'm very communicative by nature. I like uh, communicating with people. I like helping people communicate. So interpreting or translating helped me do exactly that. And uh, now I'm uh, no longer working uh, for uh, for them, but I work for a judicial institution here in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but the focus is still the same, although the, the sector is different. But it still fulfills me because um, I'm learning new things. Uh, for example, because I work now in a judicial institution, I learn more about law. So that's interesting. Mm. And uh, I meet uh, new people, again, from a different profession. And I see how things work in the judiciary from that angle. So it really opens up the world to me. It opens up my profession, opens up society to me and gives me insight that I believe wouldn't have uh, had I been employed in a different job, you know, had I had a different profession. So um, I'm very passionate about it because also the judiciary in Bosnia and Herzegovina is doing an important uh, job. You know, there is an ongoing judicial reform. So also as a citizen of this country, it's important to me to give some kind of a contribution to uh, improving the situation in the judiciary in my country. So from that perspective, it's also important to me. But uh, anyway, it gives me an opportunity to, to uh, do what I love to do. And I also get paid for it. So mm. for me, it's great. <laughs> really, it's it sounds great. wonderful. Very impressive. So uh, when you say, you know, you know, work for the, ju the judiciary, are you mm -hmm. a civil servant? You work for the, no. the states? No. no, I'm not a civil servant. This is a project that uh, this judicial institution is having. So it is a full time job, but I'm not a civil servant. I'm a different uh, category of employee uh, altogether. I'm, I'm so-called uh, project uh, staff. And I work as a conference interpreter, which is a completely different mode of mm. interpretation that I than I had in the past with the military, which means I do simultaneous uh, interpretation in conferences and meetings. And that's also a challenge because it is very fast and you have to have a really fast mind in order to be able to do it and to have a, a huge vocabulary of judicial terminology. So that was also a professional challenge that I accepted and uh, it was very satisfying, you know, to, to meet that challenge. So, yeah. Do you have like, do you have like a thirst for knowledge as well? Do Absolutely. Just love Absolutely. knowledge, you love reading. Always. I can tell. I love to. I love to. It's, it's my life. I've been a bookworm all my life, you know. <laughs> so I went to grammar school and in grammar school we had two foreign languages and Latin. So... Uh, I always have this unquenchable thirst for knowledge because uh, I have that uh, vata dosha mind that is never, never still. It's always restless. So I, 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 I need new ideas, new people, new concepts, uh, new knowledge <laughs> to feel completely happy. That I cannot exist without uh, learning something new. You know, every day, every year, it's mm. just part of my personality. And can you imagine that when a such mind encounters the vast knowledge of vedas you know you can never stop learning absolutely not so there there will always be something for you to read absolutely in, in, in the kind of vedic literature things that you still haven't read yet or things you want to read again there is yes. kind of so much to go over um i was very impressed to hear that you'd work for the bbc but then i was even more impressed to, to hear that you'd you'd work for nato uh yes. that's that's quite something two massive organizations and you mentioned also um jeremy bowen you mentioned yeah, from BBC. Yeah. Yeah. So he's still working. I mean, he was on the TV just last night. Uh, he's, I know. you know, live from Jerusalem because of the troubles that have started again. Yes. Um, yes. But Jeremy Bowen is 
I don't know how old he is, but he's been doing this for 40, 50 years. He's yes, yes. He's a a, a very uh, well respected, you know, journalist. Yes, yes. I've met him, and I worked with him uh, once. I didn't work with him often because these BBC journalists were always rotating. Uh, him and Alan Little and K Kate Tady, um, they were always rotating. So. I worked with him once, by, but I remember him, and it was quite an interesting experience. It was a good experience, and the others, you know. But that's like, you know, that's war for you. All the media come here, and then as an interpreter, you, you connect yourself with them, you start working with them. So I had access to people that I uh, normally wouldn't. So, mm. so that's one of the... Uh, upsides if you could say of the and that whole situation but it was really interesting because from professional point of view i could see uh how the big professionals work you know uh, you get like a sort of an internship that you would usually never get at your university you see the great alan little work i even met once because we would always go to the press conferences daily press briefings that the un was holding back then and all the journalists would go there. And that's how I also met Christiana Mampour. I, I met her. And, and yeah, yeah. So I met all these big names. Uh, I didn't work with all of them, but it was interesting to see, you know, how how they work. That was also a, a special privilege that I'm thankful for. Wow. It sounds like you've done a lot. Um <laughs> I say I say that like you're 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 old. You're not old at all. You're not even getting old, but you've done a lot in your time, and uh, just the fascination with the kind of devotional life and kind of work life as well. Um, I am getting old, Narada, but it's fine. We are not this body, but it's because I started young. I started when I was eighteen, and I had to because there was a war around me and I, as I said, I wanted to help my parents and uh, the way I helped them was to find a job and to to earn some money so that then we could survive because those were really hard times. But, um, you know, I have very positive experiences from all of that and a lot of experience because I started when I was 18. So yeah, next year it will be full 30 years. <laughs> Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um that's really inspiring. I'm very inspired by your story, actually. Um, I mean, as I said it before, I think certainly before um I hit the record button, you know, mm -hmm. that I know very little about you, which is good, which means when mm -hmm. I ask the questions, I'll be genuinely surprised by the answers. And you mm -hmm. mentioned, I think, within the first three or four minutes of this podcast, is that you were a refugee at the age of 16. Yes, yes, yes. I was living as a refugee in Croatia. Mm. And I just think because of things happening in the world right now, it's so important mm -hmm. to understand that anyone can be a refugee. Being Absolutely. A refugee status, can it, anyone can experience that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's it's such a, such a uh, important, not important, but how would I say, impactful event in my life. You know, we have a running joke here in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, how do you know that you are Bosnian? Everything in your life is defined as before and after the war, because mm. war is the de defining moment event of our lives. Everything changed. So everything is before and after. And uh, that's how your life is defined by it. And you you learn so many important life uh, lessons in, in, in that, what you go through. And definitely everyone can be a refugee mm. because as we learn from Srimad Bhagavatam, you know, this world is a dangerous place and the state of war is not something that is recent. Actually, when we look at, uh, look at history of humanity, it's something that's been going on always. And I'm, I'm afraid to say, unfortunately, wars will be happening in the future as well. So um, that is just a big, big uh, lesson, I believe, to humanity that not to take everything for granted and to, to really be grateful for everything that we have in our lives, everything that's good, uh, everything that is beneficial to us and to appreciate each other and to help each other out because you never know what's going to happen. And actually to use every single moment of our lives 
in a purposeful way because uh, you never know what's going to happen. And uh, the point of whole Bhakti Yoga is that we develop love and care towards each other. And especially we need to love and care each other in these hard times. So, so, so if you know somebody who is a refugee, help them because it's really a difficult, traumatic experience. Mine was not so traumatic because I lived in a family. I told you they were my father's friends and they had, this was a very nice family, a married couple with a, a daughter and a son. And a daughter was my uh, peer. She was the same age. And then I uh, started going to uh, same school. I continued with the grammar school, even in split. And they all accepted me very nicely. I have nothing but positive uh, memories from that time because uh, as I recently wrote also one article and I published it on my uh, Facebook page about that experience, it's because um, split and, and uh, that part of the, the Adriatic coast, Dalmatia, they have very strong anti-fascist tradition. So, and uh, when, when the war broke out in former Yugoslavia, people were still very much in that spirit and they, they've they been uh, raised in that spirit. So it didn't matter that I was of different religion or different nationality. That environment accepted me. I felt accepted by society. I, I experienced very little provocations, even in the worst of wartime, um, you know, happenings. So... It's, it's really a testimony to them understanding the, the point of the, the essence of religion. And that is, you know, to care for another human being, like, uh, like it's said uh, in one of the Ten Commandments, thou shall love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter who your neighbor is, that's a human being. And if they are in distress, try to help them somehow. So it's it's big testimony to, to them that they've learned that lesson. And I hope that people understand that everywhere, no matter with, which religion they are practicing, it's it's the most important thing to, to all of us, just to be a human being and to be compassionate. Mm. Well, well, don't worry, Amala Prema. I'm, we're singing from the same hymn sheet. I, I agree with you completely. I, I have no problem with people moving from country to country. Um, you know, it's a bit of a political issue. And, uh, you know, uh, but I'm all in favour of people moving to safer countries and being in much safer environments from where they've come from. And uh, um, I try to remain neutral on these podcasts, but I'm going to come off the fence very briefly. You know, I, I, I love to welcome people in the UK. You know, I have no problem with people moving to the UK because they want a better life. Um, mm -hmm. um, I know there's um, certain people that uh, listen to this podcast who don't agree with that, but I, you know, it doesn't bother me people coming to the UK. Um, um, <laughs> um, we've got, a, you know, we've in the UK, we've got a million job vacancies at the moment. Mm -hmm. And you just can't, whatever you, you can do, you just can't persuade the British people to fill them. So let's welcome some others to come and provide them with jobs. Um, mm. So, yeah, um, before we sorry, I got a bit political then. Um, okay. <laughs> um, before we finish, can you tell us a bit about um, if people want to find out more about the Krishna consciousness movement, about ISKCON in Bosnia and Herzegovina? Are there websites or Facebook pages they can go to? Well, there is a Facebook page that I used to edit. I'm not editing it any longer, mm. but it's called, uh, well, it's in Bosnian language. So I don't know how much helpful it is to. Okay. To, I uh, might try and find it and publish it, with this, called, publish it with this broadcast. It's called Hare Krishna in Bosnian Herzegovina. That was my idea of uh, bringing uh, the, 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 the devotees and the movement closer to the wider public. Because when you say Iskot, to the larger public, it doesn't mean anything. They don't know what it is. But every know when you say Hare Krishna, no, everybody knows that. You know, they they call us Hare Krishna people. You know, like I suspect in many other countries of the world. Mm -hmm. So that's why I renamed that page instead of Iskon Bosnia Herzegovina. I said Hare Krishna in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and of course, in the category about the page it is explained that it is the page of the international society for krishna consciousness in bosnia and herzegovina so uh, it is it's gone but it's uh, in my opinion as a journalist and as an interpreter language shouldn't be a barrier 
uh, language uh, should be made simple so that the large public can uh, can find uh, ISKCON accessible. So because this was a big issue in my country, uh, remember Shla Prabhupada, of course, introduced uh, Krishna consciousness to the West in English and all his books were then translated into other languages. But in practical terms, in the movement, what happened that in former Yugoslavia, devotees use a strange mixture of their own mother tongue and a lot of English words and also a lot of Sanskrit words. So from somebody, for somebody from outside who listens to devotees speak, sometimes sometimes they completely are, uh, you know, un incomprehensible for the larger public. Devotees cannot be so easily understood. So I always insisted that we uh, make uh, the language uh, clear and uh, simple so that the uh, public can understand us. And that's why I renamed it Hare Krishna in Bosnia Herzegovina and always endeavored to explain all the Sanskrit and English words. So because, you know, uh, language shouldn't be a barrier. It should actually bring people closer. So mm. if anyone's interested, they can look it up on Facebook. Okay. I'll be sure to put a link to that if I can find it. If you send me the link, maybe I'll put a link to it when this podcast is broadcast. Um, okay. Make a note of that. Um, mm. Believe it or not, uh, Amala Pema, we've been chatting for well over an hour. Wow, <laughs> um, which is about an hour 15 minutes so we've been recording this podcast anyway it's been it's been wonderful it's been wonderful to hear your story okay. um you know i didn't know all of these things about you so it was it's been great to hear your story and to hear your enthusiasm for krishna consciousness and your enthusiasm for reaching out to normal people if that makes sense um <laughs> because the movement's never going to grow unless we step out of our comfort zones and just go and chat to real people out in the street and explain what Bhakti Yoga is. Absolutely. That's my a firm, firm belief after all the service that I've done and my experience. I also agree with one practical element that you mentioned earlier, and that is plain clothes or let's say, let's call it, you know, Western clothes. I uh, believe that our generations, generations before us maybe were... Uh, interested uh, in uh, Vaishnava clothes, especially for ladies, because saris are so beautiful. I love saris, but, and have lots of them and never had a problem wearing one, but it's not a good, in my opinion, from my experience, it's uh, not really a fruitful tactic in introducing Krishna consciousness to the public who is, which is not so interested in, in that type of attire. I believe once even um, in a summer camp in 1997, my Guru Maharaj came to Croatia. We all went there and he held a seminar and the seminar was exactly about that topic, how to introduce Krishna consciousness to other people. And we were all brainstorming and they were not just his disciples, everyone in the camp, disciples of other gurus also participated. Mm. And he was writing down on his flip charts, all the ideas that uh, devotees were churning about, you know, how to present Christian consciousness. And one of the ideas was maybe wear devotional clothes in public. And then at the end of the seminar, there were lots and lots of ideas on that flip chart. My Guru Maharaj kindly asked all the devotees to take some of these ideas, at least one, and try to implement them in their lives, you know, test them out to see how it works. And I was thinking afterwards what idea I would take. And I decided because I'm, of course, in a female body and very much interested in the nice clothes, always have been my whole life. And I love saris. And I said, okay, great. I will wear devotional clothes in public and that's how I will get people to ask me why am I wearing this and I will you know talk about Krishna consciousness and I did that and I it was summertime so it was perfect climate and um, I uh, went to work in a sari and the results were that nobody asked me anything and later on I was thinking why and and uh, my colleagues at work were all foreigners. They were, you know, from uh, all the countries around the world, uh, like Western Europe, America, Australia. 
And then I was thinking to myself, well, it's nothing new to them because you have in England, you in UK, you have a very large Indian population. It's nothing for Britons to see somebody in a sari, also for Americans or Australians. So, and I understood that uh, that they see it as Indian and they do not want to be Indian, which is understandable. But Krishna consciousness is not Indian philosophy. It's universal philosophy. Mm. It's spiritual philosophy for all mankind for all humanity and that's uh why i stopped wearing uh, uh vaishnava clothes outside and uh, whenever i went on book distribution uh outside in the streets i would wear plain clothes and i was very successful always people would take the books and i understood that uh, we we need to uh, adjust these external elements that are allowed to be uh, adjusted for our outreach to the public mm. you know so otherwise we we uh, people will see it as something indian we need to understand how they perceive us in order to present krishna consciousness in a better way to them so uh i would say that uh, dressing now in uh, plain clothes is much more effective of course this does not go the same for temple and somebody doing service in the temple like worshiping at the altar or cooking in Krishna's kitchen or Radharani's kitchen more actually better said um, but when you are go doing outreach when you're going outside I believe it's it's uh, much more uh, sensible to do it in uh, plain clothes and uh, in this way we will attract people who are looking for these uh, universal spiritual values they're not looking for clothes because the gone are the generations of the hippies who were so mesmerized by India and everything mm. that India mm. represented, uh, even in terms of uh, culture and clothing, because uh, the young people of today are not interested in that. It's as simple as that. It's a simple truth. So I fully support, you know, programs such as Krishna West, and I understand uh, the background for it, and I believe uh, it is successful way to to present Krishna consciousness to the younger generations mm. Mm. well I agree with everything you I agree with everything you've just said I mean um I, I if you look at um I don't know I've, I've used this example before on this podcast if you look at Christianity as a religious tradition Christianity has mm -hmm. been around for 2000 years and it's been very successful mm -hmm. uh one of the one of the things that's allowed it to be successful is is it has molded and adapted from generation to generation. So the message of Christianity always stays the same or generally stays the same that, you know, Jesus is God, God came to earth as Jesus and he died for our sins. Mm -hmm. And you follow the example that Jesus set. Um, mm -hmm. But the way that Christianity is presented um, changes according to time, place and circumstance and yes. the types of clothes that Christians might wear. So I'm from, mm -hmm. I'm from Somerset in, uh, mm -hmm. in Southwest England. And mm -hmm. so the Methodist church, which is a non-conformist Anglican church, is quite strong mm -hmm. here. So village Christianity, village Methodist Christianity in Somerset, England, is very different from, I don't know, Orthodox Christian, Syrian Orthodox Christianity in Kerala, India. Mm. It looks quite different. Mm. And the experiences are, are different. But the mm. message of Jesus Christ is the same. Yes. So Christianity has been successful because it's adapted according to time, place and circumstance. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, in the Gaudiya Vaishnav tradition, we seem to struggle with this idea of, of doing, this, doing things differently. And some devotees have this fear of um, doing things differently in case it is an offense to somebody or an offense to the parampara system. You know, and so I agree, therefore, with everything you've just said. And I, I haven't won a doti for ages. I, I mean, I have I have a doti in the, in the cupboard behind me. And if I go to an event where it's appropriate for me to wear a doti based on time, place, circumstance, then I'll wear it. I mean, that's very rare these days. Mm -hmm. I just prefer wearing jeans and a shirt because that's the culture that I'm from and that I live in and I'm most comfortable with. Yes, and it's perfectly acceptable. And I know uh, Srila Prabhupada even um, never asked directly his uh, or indirectly his disciples to wear dhoti and a kurta. Mm -hmm. He always wanted them to dress as, quote, English gentlemen. 
I read those passages of, you know, conversation between Shlaprapad and his disciples where he explained, I wanted you to look like an English gentleman wearing a coat pant. That's how Shlaprapad called it. And, uh, but you, you know, decided on your own to wear, you know, dhoti and a kurta, but you didn't have to, Shlaprapad basically said. And, you know, so it just illustrates that the Shla Prabhupada, uh, understood these points that you just said, Narada, and uh, wanted people to accept the, the, the practice of Krishna consciousness and understood that, uh, you know, clothes is just an external element. And, it, and there, there is no such big emphasis on it, especially if we are taught that, uh, you know, we, we learn from the previous acharyas in our sampradaya. And, and one uh, good example of that, how somebody recognized time, place, and circumstances is Shilabhaksidanta Saraswati Thakur, who used to wear shoes and a coat. That was uh, in his time and day, you know, in India back then, that was unheard of, that the sannyasi would wear a coat and shoes. But he understood, you know, the circumstances and uh, he was uh, preaching boldly, fiercely, as we all know. And there was no change in the message, in the teaching, which is the essence that we are trying to convey. We are not trying to start a new fashion trend. That's not the point of the Hare Krishna movement. <laughs> it's actually the point is to give the knowledge and knowledge is universal. We, it's spiritual, it's applicable for every human being, and these external elements, I believe, can absolutely be adjusted uh, because, as we said, time, place, time, place, and circumstances. You know, I'm not. I, I'm. I'm. I want to finish on a positive note, but one guru in Iskon um, says that um, <laughs> when you look at the Hari Krishna movement today, it's like it's like looking at a museum. Um, you know, in terms of we were, why are you stuck in the 1960s? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was like 60 years ago. You yes. gotta move on, but yeah, it's like yes. looking at a museum, isn't it? Why are you still dressed like that? But yes, I was yes. different opinions. Um, okay, um, I'm gonna say goodbye to everybody watching at home, and you and I can have a brief debrief after. Um, Amala Prama, it's been wonderful to have you as guest number 88 on the Harry Krishna Project podcast. <laughs> um, thank you for inviting me it was also a wonderful experience for me and um you might be number 88 but you're the first from bosnia and herzegovina which is wonderful <laughs> but i'm aware of anyway I, I don't think i've had anyone else from there <laughs> um so it's been fantastic to have you as the guest on this week's podcast um and i hope to um hear more about the Krishna conscious community and uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina and I hopefully lots of positive stuff as well so a big thank you to you for joining us this week um, do not forget if you're watching this on YouTube please do um, hit the subscribe button so you can keep updated about future podcasts please do leave a constructive comment um, I mean uh, believe it or not you're allowed to disagree with the contents of this podcast um, uh, <laughs> I have to explain that to devotees all the time you're allowed to have your own opinion it's fine yes, um, yes. you can you can give some feedback positive or negative but if it's negative please put it in a constructive way um, mm -hmm. and if you're watching this on Facebook uh, it's the same as well please do give some good positive feedback uh, and also follow or like the Harry Krishna Project page and find out who our guest will be uh, next week so until next week I'll see you all soon thank you Harry Krishna Harry Krishna